So today I'm continuing on with the um, Int Intimacy with God series. This is session six on relationships, uh, experiencing his heart through interaction with others. Uh, in this sermon, I'm going to talk about how our relationships with other people can bring us closer to God. People can bring out the best and they can bring out the worst in us. The question is, do our relationships pull us closer to God or push us further away? Are you afraid of interacting with other people? Do you isolate yourself from others so that you're not tainted by what's going on in the world today? So it's at the end of the sermon, I hope that you'll, you'll see how God can use our relationships with others in the world today as a way of drawing us closer to him. Amen? Okay, so my first point is on relationship with the world. Old habits. We have old habits that trip us up every once in a while. Um, little story first. I love starting with a little story. Anyways, um, I had an old friend that I used to work with in the military. And I hadn't seen him for about, I don't know, about four or five years. And I, I ran into him over Christmas. And we had sat down, we had a coffee. And after talking to him f for about five minutes, it's like we had never stopped working together. We just got back into our old way and everything was going great. And then after about 15 minutes, he talked about someone that I didn't particularly like. And I said, oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, and then I stopped and in my mind's eye, I could see these words lifting up out of a pool of water. And this is what they said. First John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. I realized that something drastic had changed. As we talked, I, I realized that my conversation was flowing back into the way I used to talk, which is not a good thing. My friend hadn't changed. He still swore excessively. He still criticized everything and everyone in his life. He still talked about women in a derogatory fashion. He still, he still talked about the house he was going to buy. Now that he'd been promoted, he talked about his motorcycle that he was rebuilding. And at that point, I realized that the Holy Spirit was showing me how much I had changed from who I used to be. With this in mind, I had another look at our conversation, and it troubled my spirit. It troubled my soul. It was then that another verse came to mind. James 4.4. 4. Another comes to mind. There we go. James 4, 4. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Wow. It's then that the Lord gave me an opening. Because, see, I had witnessed to this man back, oh, about three years ago. And as I was talking, you know, he, he was talking to me, and so we finished talking about that, and he says to me, because he knew that I was in the mystery, he said, so, he said, what's going on with you? Has, has anything changed? And I went, mm, yeah, a little bit. So I brought him up to date on what the Lord was doing in my life. And it's funny, as I started to talk about what, what had been going on, not going into any great detail, that he stopped talking, and his face changed. And he's looking at me like I've got a third eye here. You see, I didn't gloss over what had happened in my life. I could have. Like a lot of times we do, oh, yeah, yeah, things are okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm doing some stuff. I went here and there and all that. But I took a stand, 
And I told him exactly what was going on, right, right between the eyes. I wasn't who I was six years ago. I'm a completely different person. I had a chance to revert to my old ways, but I didn't. Why? Look at Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Spiritually, we can't love the ways of the world and love God at the same time. And this is something that we cannot be vague about. Who is it that we take a stand for? Do we believe and state that, yes, we believe that there is a living God and that he sent his son to save us from our sins? Or do we just go on talking like we do every day, the way that the world does? So I took a stand for what I believed in with him. And God will give us courage to do this. When we actually put ourselves out there and actually go the extra mile and step out, Tim, 2 Timothy 1.7 There we go. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I wasn't being influenced by my old friend anymore. I was starting to influence him with who I had become. And we have to influence people. Acts 14, 15. This is Paul, when he was in Lystra, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? that you should turn from these useless things to a living God. So he was influencing them, telling them, why are you worshiping these, all these other gods that are in the world? Worship God. He is the only one that matters. Don't isolate yourself from the world. A lot of Christians live in a Christian bubble. They're afraid to get out there. They say, oh, I'm comfortable in my bubble. Lord, yeah, I feel good. I feel good. No one's bugging me. But that's not what Jesus died on the cross to give us. We have to get out and talk to people. We have friends, coworkers. We all have a circle of influence in our lives. Don't be afraid. Trust in God when you, like, One of the other sermons that I gave, when you step out, when you step through that veil of fear, God will meet you on the other side and he will take you where it is that he wants you to go. But we have to step out. We have to. Do you realize how much we can, how much we can influence people in our lives? But to do that, we have to live the kind of life that Jesus died to give us. We have to draw near to God. James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. As you step out, as you walk towards him, he will be there to meet you. But he is not going to push you. He is not going to grab you and pull you. It's your choice. It's a choice that we have to take. Every time that we do something to influence others and bring the kingdom of God closer to earth, we are moving closer to God in our relationships. So, main point to relationships with God. So we're going from relationship, relationships with the world. Now let's look at our relationship with God. How to have intimacy with God. As we draw closer to God, we are going to desire a more intimate relationship with him. You can't help it. The Holy Spirit is there and he is touching us. To be intimate with someone means that we know them at a deeper level, not on the surface. We are also very aware that when someone damages a relationship, we know when that relationship is damaged. You know, we can tell. So how close are you to your Heavenly Father today? Have you been drawing closer to him? 
Distance doesn't matter. Yeah, I want to write one. Uh, when we were in the Philippines, I had a, a chance to talk with Jason, who is the son of Pastor Danden and Pastor Shirley. And before I stood up to talk in the cinema, uh, sorry, the uh, seminar that we were doing, uh, he asked me, he said, Mike, um, could you talk about something? He said, the, he said, the people here, when people come from the West or from outside, they're always talking about joy and peace and how God's changed their life and everything. But they say, well, we don't see that happening here. And he says, tell them that we are all the same. And so I did. It doesn't matter that they're on the other side of the world. We are all in the body of Christ. We are all brethren. We are all sons and daughters of the Most High God. And the thing is, if we feel distant from God, usually it's because something has changed, right? Something has changed. So the secret to drawing near to God and having him draw near to us is revealed clearly in the Bible. We draw near to God through faith in Jesus Christ, who alone gives us access to God. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The Lord will strongly support us and manifest himself to us when he sees someone in their heart truly wanting to get closer to God. Okay, but again, it's a heart desire. It's not work. This is something that comes from our heart. John 14, 23. And Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. So again, we have to draw closer to God. He, he knows our hearts. There's nothing we can, get, we can get around. I don't know about you, but I want a more intimate relationship with God. Amen? I realized that sitting on a bench in church once a week just wasn't going to do that. Was it easy? No. But as I walked with the Lord, the Holy Spirit started to change me. And I started to notice this. I started getting opportunities to talk to people. Uh, at one time in the past, I didn't think that I needed relationship with other Christians. I could do it. I had my Bible, and I didn't need it. It was just God and me. We're good. But then once I started coming to church, I realized just how much I needed uh, those those relationships, how much I needed from other Christians that are around me. You know, a smile, a hug, being prayed for. So how do we know if we're moving closer to God? Here's some signs. And adversity will bring us closer to God if we allow it to change us. Okay, sorry about that. The first one is being persecuted for the Bible. Sometimes when we tell others about the Lord, we get a backlash, right? Amen, people don't want to hear it. But take heart, because this is probably a strong indication that what you're doing is, is the right thing. John 16, 33. Sorry, again. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is a promise. Don't give up. If we do what Jesus did, then we are moving closer to him. We can benefit from adversity. It'll bring us closer to God. It will mature us as Christians and allow us to reflect God's love to the world. No. Sorry? Okay, there we go. Be more sensitive to sin. As you walk, walk closer with the Lord, you'll find that you are more aware of sin in your life. This is the Holy Spirit at work. When you open your life to the Holy Spirit's influence, 
you will see yourself starting to change. We all sin, and we're told this in the Bible. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is something that we have to do. We can't not confess our sins. We need to pray and confess our sins to the Lord. This is something that we have as Christians that unbelievers don't have. We can pray and be forgiven for our sins. Only then can we walk closer with our Lord and Savior. We need to have a desire of more of what the world is doing in our life. If we have sin, we need to identify these things that are not in agreement with God's word and change them. We have to desire to be in the body. Philippians 3.20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are members of the body of Christ, the church. Jesus is the head of the church, and he is the great shepherd. I used, like I said, I didn't think I needed to go to church before. When I started going, I realized how wrong I had been. We need the fellowship with other saints. We need to desire to be with others. This is where we can show the love of God. It doesn't matter, like I was saying before, it doesn't matter where we live. Um, like I was saying with, um, with Jason, when we were talking, he say, "Well, you know, are we different? Are, are you know, you got to talk to pe you know, talk to our people." But this is important. Look at this. Romans two eleven. For God shows no partiality; He doesn't. We're all children to Him, but no one is better than others. The Bible says that God sees us the same as Jesus. I think that's just amazing that us sinners can be seen the same way. So we're all in a relationship with the body of Christ. Um, from what I read in the Bible, I notice that the more I desire to be closer to God, the more I desire to be closer to you folks, to other people that are Christians. We need a growing hunger for God's word. God word is the bread of life. God said in Hosea 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Our knowledge of God's word keeps us safe from the attacks of Satan. If we don't have promises that we can know, that we can rely on, we are going to get pulled away by the things in the world, what Satan throws at us. We can encourage ourselves. We can encourage each other. This is so important. It equips us to fight against the temptations of Satan. It strengthens the armor that we have, that God's word gives us, which is knowledge. I hunger to know Christ better. If I eat, I'll get hungry again. But John 6.35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. If you have a growing hunger for God's word, you're probably growing closer to God. We need, the last one, we need to seek to serve more. We have to get out of our comfort zone. This is what I was talking about before. We can't just sit there. We've got to get out of our comfort zone. And it's very hard to do because people don't like being stretched. Not really. They don't like. But for me, being stretched is the fastest way to get closer to God. I always feel better when I get out of my comfort zone and, and do something. Uh, I found out that God is very, very patient. Um, one time I was up in Ottawa, and I had a man that I could testify to, and I chickened out. 
And I went to my room that night going, eh, come, eh, kicking myself. And I said, Lord, if you give me another chance, I'll testify to him. Well, guess what? Next day at lunch, same situation, and I did. And, and it was quite, it was quite amazing. Uh, this guy didn't yell at me. He was hard army. Like I thought he'd say, what the hell are you talking about? Get out of here. He didn't. It really opened up, and I was amazed just because I stepped out. I got out of my comfort zone, and the Lord showed me it works. Relationships are very important to us as humans. We need relationships. We can't, it's hard to live in a vacuum by yourself. We need shoulders to lean on sometimes. We need people that we can vent to. Our relationships can hold us accountable. In our spiritual walk, others can say, what are you doing in your Christian walk? There's also another dynamic that can help us with our relationships. It's to look past ourselves and to help our brethren with their walk. And Barnabas was such a man. Do you remember Barnabas in the New Testament? He's the one that um, Paul hooked up with. He's the one that went to the apostles in Jerusalem and said, no, Paul has changed, or Saul has changed, and he's one of us now. He was an encourager. Barnabas means son of encouragement. And he encouraged others to follow the teachings of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage each other and build each other up. So why am I talking about Barnabas? Well, I want to talk briefly about the kind of relationship that we can have within the body of Christ. And I don't know if this is the proper name, but I, I called it the Barnabas-Paul-Timothy relationship. Oops, only one page. Like I said, Barnabas was an encourager, a mentor. He was the iron that sharpened the iron of Paul. And what do I mean by that? It means that somebody that's good enough of a friend that they can come to us and they can talk into our lives. They're not afraid of hurting us because we realize they're trying to help us. Barnabas was to Paul what Jesus is to us. He is our brother. Jesus is our brother. Barnabas was a brother to Paul. So when these two men traveled, the Holy Spirit gave them the power they needed to speak boldly about God. They drew closer to the Lord through their ministry as they went around to different places in their common mission to spread the, the gospel to the unsaved. At this time, Paul started a ministry with a young man named Timothy, who was a son. He trained Timothy personally for the ministry. Paul said of Timothy in Philippians 2.22, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. This shows that their relationship was as a son to a father. In this relationship, Paul is the spiritual father who demonstrates the love of our heavenly father. Timothy is the spiritual son. I have a spiritual father. Here, I also have several, I'm very lucky to have several Barnabases in my life. Okay, people that talk. But, again, what is this father-son relationship? Well, they, they, they input into each other's lives. They have a connection, a connection that matures them in their relationship. You're not just a spiritual father because of your mature characteristics in a deep relationship. 
you have to talk into, as a normal father would do, you have to talk into someone else's life. You have to build them up. You have to mentor them. You have to teach them. A spiritual father reproduces spiritual children who have a passionate and intimate relationship with their Lord and Savior. The spiritual growth process of a son or daughter must continue so that they can also become spiritual fathers. And just a note here, when I say spiritual father and spiritual son, there are also spiritual mothers and spiritual daughters. Okay, so nobody throw anything at me, okay? In 2 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy, no, oh, sorry. Bad finger. There we go. Paul gives four characteristics of a spiritual father. First, there must be a heart connection where the father loves the son. He must pray consistently for his son. This is something else that has to be done. 2 Timothy 1 verse 6 says that Paul imparted or gave into Timothy's life. He sowed into Timothy's life what he wanted him to know. And he reminded Timothy, and he says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Before he went away on his ministry, they laid hands on him, and off he went. And he also told him not to be afraid of people that were, didn't want to listen to him because he was young. Okay, so he constantly lifted him up. And fourthly, he has to be an encourager. He was constantly encouraging Timothy. And he said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a strong mind. He was exhorting him, encouraging him, helping him along. So what are the characteristics of a spiritual son or daughter? Their first one is their passion for God. They have to be, they have to have a hunger that they can act on. They have to desire to grow in the Lord. They position themselves to learn, not just sit off on the side somewhere. They position themselves, they take courses, whatever. They have a heart to serve. They want to serve others. They're not proud. They're humble. They want to serve other people. They, oh, their response to authority. Hmm. A lot of people are full of pride. They don't want to be told what to do. I can try to talk into someone's life, and they look and say, well, who does he think he is? You know? The thing is, they have to respond well. They have to be teachable. How well do people handle correction? Oh, that's another one. That hurts. A lot of people don't like to be corrected. They don't have a humble heart. I know what to do. Don't tell me. I know what to do. Well, sometimes we don't. We don't. We are so far out. We're done a patat, way out in left field somewhere. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> and last one is their endurance. How long are you willing to wait are you willing to wait for God's timing, not yours? Oh, I'm ready to go into ministry now. Well, God can say, mm, not yet. You have to stay the course. You cannot push things. So why am I explaining this? Because there is a deeper level in our relationships that we can go to where we will walk closer with God. Everybody should desire to make disciples. Everybody, all of us, not just the leadership, not just the pastors, every single one of us should desire to make disciples. It's commanded in the Bible. We steward relationships. We take care of them. We develop them. We develop people. We don't worry just about ourselves. We go out of the box, out of our comfort zone, and we talk 
into other people's lives. And this is what the Lord wants us to do. So as my old mentor would say, so what? Why am I telling you all this stuff? Human beings are relational animals. We need relationships to be healthy physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The question is, how are you going to interact with people that the Lord has brought to you? Are you going to push them away, or are you going to take an interest? It's a very good chance that the Lord has brought that person. You say, oh, I wonder where that guy came from. I wonder, yeah, I've seen that person so many times, and now why are they talking to me? It could quite well be that the Lord, it was time, and he went, here, talk. This person is ready to hear about me. They're open to it. Something has happened in their life. They are now open. And this is the job I'm given to you, to talk to them. Don't turn away. This is a relationship. And finally, like I said, what's the final point? If you want to get closer to God, get out of your comfort zone and talk to people about what your Heavenly Father has done in your life. That is all you have to do. Most of us aren't evangelists, but they're so powerful. If you can talk to someone and say, you know what the Lord did for me the other day? And most people will go, wow. And that will stick up here. They might, maybe they won't believe you. I don't know, but you've sown the seed. When I knew I had stepped out of my comfort zone, and I'm going to close with this, when? When I stepped out of my, clo my comfort zone was when I felt closest to my Heavenly Father. It's when I truly felt that I was advancing the kingdom of God within my circle of influence. It's when I saw the Holy Spirit working in my life. I could actually see it. When I got past the thing, oh, that was just coincidence. No, it wasn't. I started to see times when the Lord had brought people to me. When I realized I could trust God to be with me, and this was a big one, I could step out. I could be in relationship with people to further the kingdom of God, and to walk closer to God by stepping out, getting out of my comfort zone, getting a little bit of courage, and, and God, you got to be with me. And he was. He never left me alone any time I've stepped out and talked to people. And it also encouraged me more to talk to other people. You know, when things go good the first time, you go, hey, I can do this. And I did. I did talk to more people. So here's my challenge to you. Go out and talk to someone. Even if you say, oh, I, I can't do that. I, I, I'm too shy. No, you can do it. There's got to be people that you talk to on a daily basis that you can say, you know what the Lord did for me the other day? Tell them. Don't be afraid. God is there. Amen? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for being in our lives, being a part of our lives. Lord, give us the courage to step out safe in the knowledge that you are always with us. So, Father, I lift everyone here up to you. Lord, that you will bless them, that you will be with them in the coming week until we are together again. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to add a couple things to what Mike said to make it really clear for all of us. Um, he talked about the Barnabas, Paul, and Timothy relationships. Uh, here's, here's how this works. When I come to someone, and, and why all three relationships are so, so important in our lives. See, when you come to someone in that Barnabas relationship, that brother relationship, how, what was he? And, and save, save with Pastor Mike here. So I come to him as a brother. And as I come to him as a brother, and I say, Lord, I need to know how to encourage him. I need to know the right words to say to him. 
Lord, teach me how to be more brotherly towards him. See, so that draws me into more intimacy with the Father because I'm now relying on the Father to teach me how to be a brother. But when I am a brother, I'm coming to him as, as Jesus, our, our, our brother, right? And so I'm, I'm learning how to develop the character of Christ in my life so that I always come to him full of grace. I also co always come to him with compassion. I al always come to him with love and care. And at the same time, when I allow him to be a brother in my life, then I have to learn how to receive the heart of a brother towards me, right? So I've got to open up my heart. I've got to learn how to take time, listen to him, how to uh, graciously respond to his correction, encouragement, rebuke, all these things. And that teaches me how more to be a brother to Jesus, because he also has words of correction, encouragement, and yes, a little bit of rebuke, right? So when I, I desperately need brothers in my life, brothers and sisters in my life, so that when I come to them in that relationship, that teaches me how to be more like Jesus, that teaches me how to receive more from Jesus, my elder brother, right? And that causes me to rely more on the Lord. Now, what about spiritual father? When I come as a spiritual father to someone, I'll, I'll use Mike again. We're going to change relationships now. So I come to Mike as a spiritual father now. Right away, I got to say, God, teach me how to be more fatherly to Mike. Teach me how to be uh, more uh, um, gentle and patient, like, like the Heavenly Father. Teach me how to relate to him in that fatherly way that I'm always concerned more about him than in his reputation, right? Did you hear that? I'm always concerned more about him than about his reputation and my more reputation as any father really is, right? And so as I come to him as a father, I have to ask the heavenly father, Lord, how can I be more like you as father? And so as I, be, as I have a son relationship in my life or a daughter relationship in my life, I am learning how to be like Father God, and that draws me closer to Father God. Then I come to that third relationship, that son relationship, right? Everyone needs a Barnabas in their life. Everyone needs a, a spiritual son or daughter or, or more in their life, but they also need fathers and mothers, spiritual fathers and mothers. As I did with Apostle Chuck, when I asked him to be my spiritual father, suddenly he was not my, uh, what do you call it, my, my ministry um, peer anymore, right? He suddenly was my spiritual father. And I had to learn how to come to him differently. I had to learn how to come to him as a son. So what, what happened, right? Lord, teach me how to be a son. Teach me how to honor him. Teach me how to listen to what he says and evaluate. Even if I don't quite agree, I still want to hear every word he says. I want to honor his wisdom. I want to honor his, his, his maturity experience. Uh, his ministry experience, and I had to learn how to come to him as a son. And in order to do that, I had to rely more on the Father, Father God to teach me how to be a son. And as I learned to be a son to Apostle Chuck, I learned more about how to be a son to my Heavenly Father. You see? And so the best way, that's why these three relationships are so important. The Barnabas relationship, because it teaches you to be more like Jesus, your brother, the father relationship, because it teaches you more like how to be like a father to someone, which is, again, being more like Father God. And as a son or a daughter, I learn how to be more like a son or daughter, or son, in my case, son, to my Heavenly Father. So in all three cases, those three relationships are the God-given method, the God-given way to teach us how to draw closer to the Lord. You see? And that's why they're so, so important. I never knew... There was so much about God as Father I did not understand until I started fathering people and until I actually became a natural father too, right? Boy, did my life change, right? But, and, 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 and again, what happened? God, I don't know how to, these four kids are so different. Every one, like why did you give me four different types? Can't they all be like the same? So as soon as I figured out one, I could have figured out for all of them, right? But no, God gave me four different kids. And I had to say, God, how do I parent these kids? And I was expecting like a whole manual to come down from heaven, right? Because he's called Emmanuel. So obviously I expected a manual to come down from heaven. No, okay. So, <laughs> and instead, you know what he said? Father's, Father God said, 
why don't you just treat your kids, father your kids the way I father you? I went, oh, come on. It can't be that simple. And God said, start paying attention to how I father you, and I'll father your kids that way. And I went, oh, God never calls me stupid when I mess up, right? So I can't do that with my kids. He never chastises me, makes me feel guilty. He never rubs it in. He never repeats it 10 times. Remember when, right? He, and I went, wow, you're a pretty smart father. And I started doing that with my kids. Now that I come to this, this realm, and I, as I try to spiritual father some of you, never make you feel stupid, never chastise you, never try to make you feel guilty, never make you feel ashamed, because God doesn't do any of those things. See, so these three simple relationships that God wants us to have in our life, the Barnabas relationship, the Paul relationship, the father down, and the son, the Timothy relationship to a father or a spiritual mother, are, are three of the most dynamic ways that God has given to us so that we can become more like him and draw closer to him. And you will never be, the, you, you will not attain to the fullness of being a spiritual son or daughter or spiritual father or mother or brother. Or you will not draw, or those three relationships will, are the three relationships will draw you more and more into your relationship with the Heavenly Father. And that's why we're talking about this. How do you want to grow closer to the Lord? Learn to be a spiritual son or daughter. Learn to be a spiritual father or mother. And learn to be a brother. And you'll grow close, so close to the Lord. That's why God's put those in your life. Take advantage of them. That's why being alone is the worst way. Is the, well, actually, being alone is the, worst, is the best way to stop growing. Right? Father, help us to have the courage, as Mike said, to start talking to people. To be stretched in our relationships. And as we do that, Lord, give us spiritual fathers and mothers. Give us spiritual sons and daughters. And give us lots of Barnabases, spiritual brothers and sisters, that we can draw closer to you as a result. In Jesus' name. Amen.